Hi Church family, welcome to our Bible study on Romans. Sometimes you all uh, worry about me a bit because I look a bit pale, uh, probably because I've been stuck indoors for quite a long time, but that's not only it, it's also the screen and the video and the lighting. And you normally used to watch people who film themselves professionally on TV, but you just get me filmed by myself from my computer on my laptop. And I think I'm doing a pretty good job. So uh, I'm looking forward to getting a private jet for my televangelist work. But uh, it's good to be able to meet with you, to continue to meet with you. I don't know how you're feeling, but I am tired of lockdown. I'm tired of not meeting at church. I'm tired of not seeing everybody, but I know that this is the right thing that we are doing right now. And sometimes my knowing that this is the right thing that we are doing right now is uh, sort of a bit clouded by all my, my missing of seeing people, of hugging people, of shaking hands, of greeting each other at church and singing loudly together in the congregation. But we know that this is not a permanent situation. This is just for now. And sometimes we have to go through difficult situations for now in order to get to good situations later. So we'll we'll be okay. We'll manage. We'll survive. But uh, just hold on for now. And uh, we look forward to seeing you. Many people ask me how the church is doing. And I assume that means financially, etc. Um, the financially, we're doing all right. Thank you very much for continuing to give generously. If you stop giving generously, we won't be doing so all right anymore. But we also understand that some folks are not able to give as they were able to give because business, etc. is not what it used to be. And that's fine too, so that we all uh, take this together. So what we've done in terms of the Methodist Church is that we've been able to reduce our assessments and our uh, uh, payments to us ministers because us ministers normally get a, a car allowance. Now, our car allowance is based on on paying for a car and keeping it insured, which is those unfortunate expenses that you have to spend without uh, leaving the driveway. But uh, we've also we've been able to reduce in terms of mileage. Also from the church's side, from the Methodist Church of Southern Africa, we reduced our, our spending in terms of things like conference and stuff, where we would have to make sure that many ministers would travel a long distance to get to a certain place, etc. Hopefully we're learning a little bit about new kinds of efficiency, especially in terms of time and meetings. And one of the things that I've enjoyed seeing when I have been out to the shops and out and about is families going shopping together. Uh, it's so good, or oh, not shopping together, you're not supposed to do that. I saw a family in the shops, but I saw them arrive with bicycles and the whole family together going off to the shops. And I thought, you know, with the kind of work we do when we're traveling on work business and and being far away from home for all hours of the day it's good to see people when they are able to be together and so today we continue with our bible study on the book of romans uh, we skip through chapters one to four and uh, we will hopefully get back to them but i think it's important not to get bogged down in the details of chapters one to four before you get bogged down in the details of of the rest of the book so chapter five marks a sort of transition to a new phase of romans chapters five through uh, seven do a certain job then chapter eight starts talking about life in the in the power of the holy spirit and that's for next week but what happens in chapters one to four of romans is that paul speaks to his readers about uh, why gentiles and and jews can worship together in one christian family and he presents himself as having a debate with somebody who is jewish uh, about why Gentiles are able and he sort of presents both cases about how Jews and Gentiles have both sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God and how Jesus' mis mission and ministry is just what everybody needed to, to unite them once again, restore the image of God in humanity. And then from chapters 5, with beginning with therefore, he sort of builds on that argument about how seeing as we are justified by faith, we can become the community that we're meant to be. And so five, six, and seven go on to illustrate why we can belong to God's family, how we are forgiven our sins, transformed and renewed, and where we can go. Now, sometimes this is a bit overwhelming because we're used to reading Romans or hearing a verse here or there that proves something for us that we know is true or that we understand. And so it's a bit more difficult when you sort of read verse by verse, chapter by chapter, a book like Romans. And it's not all about what you want to hear all the time, because I think sometimes if we're listening to sermons and, and preachings, we're used to hearing uh, a pastor say this is what you need to hear today in this 15 minutes about this passage that I've studied and I'm bringing what I hope is God's heart to you in this place. But when we're, when we're talking about uh, 
a long study of the scripture, it's not always going to be about you. It's going to be about what's in the scripture, what the first receivers heard, what the writer was trying to say. And then you have to uh, maybe keep that in your heart and let it plant a seed to grow for later and also to help you form your faith so that you can give an account for what you believe when people need to know what you believe. Uh, before we begin, I'm going to say a prayer. Loving God, we thank you for the opportunity of studying the scriptures. And we ask that you would help us to understand what we are reading so that your Holy Spirit could speak to us and convict us of the ways that we should live, have faith and trust in you, especially when times are difficult and complicated. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we continue with uh, Romans chapter 7, but before we get into Romans chapter 7, we're going to do a little bit of a, a, a reverse and start with chapter 6. But uh, just to remind you that we started with Romans chapter 5 uh, from 1 to 21. And in that section, we read about why we are justified, that we are made right with God. And that because we are justified, we can boast, not because of who we are, but because of what Christ has done. We find that our character is formed even through the suffering that we go through. And God's love for us is real because he loved us while we were still sinners. And so then he goes on to talk about new creation and uh, talks about Adam and Christ. So Adam is this first uh, person who... who, who, who gives in to sin. Jesus, on the other hand, gives in to God. So uh, some people will sort of paint it like um, Jesus says, thy will be done. And Adam says, my will be done. But then Paul helps us to understand that Adam is a very insignificant little somebody or nobody back in the beginning, whereas Christ is, is God incarnate. And so as Christ says, yes, thy will be done, his goodness overwhelms all of the evil. And so the goodness of Christ makes the beginning of a new creation. And this theme of, of Christ having having died and, and risen again, speaks about how this death and resurrection overwhelms the death that entered into the world because of what Adam had done. And so we've gone from Romans chapter 5 and then on to Romans chapter 6, where Paul starts asking that question, should we continue in sin then? You know, if we if this grace is free, as, as people say, doesn't mean that we can just carry on as we were without um, making any changes in the ways that we live. And so in Romans chapter 6, should we continue in sin? No, we're going to walk in newness of life. Should we continue in sin? No. When you were slaves to, 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 to sin, you lived in sin. But there's no point in living like that. And so he speaks of presenting yourselves as instruments of righteousness. So if we live in the household of God, we present ourselves to be people who, who bring about change and, and newness in the world. But not only that, but we're not slaves to sin. We are rather free to become the people that we're meant to be. We're under new ownership. We're slaves to God and God alone. And God loves us. And so in being slaves to God, we are set free. And there's a good question that people can ask. If, if you think you're in control of your own life, you probably aren't. Um, so many other things take control of our lives, don't they? Our, our greed, our, our, our love of things, our lust, our addictions, all of those things take control of us. And we might think that we are in control of our own lives, but we find that we are subject to so many other forces and, and things that, that buff us around. Whereas if we put our faith in Jesus and we surrender ourselves to Jesus and to, to God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, we find that we are truly free because somebody who truly loves us more than we even love ourselves is guiding us through life. Not only guiding us, but giving us the strength and the wisdom and the power that we need to be the people that we were created to be. So then we move on to Romans chapter 7. And at the end of chapter 6, Paul continues with some a part that's, that might be a little confusing. And I just thought it was important to, to go back to the beginning of uh, chapter 7 or the end of chapter 6 and just, and just read that part together too. So from Romans chapter 6, the end of Romans chapter 6. I'm going to get my slideshow to cooperate here. 
now that my slideshow is cooperating, from the end of uh, chapter 6, we read these, these verses that are quite familiar to us. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. So we lived in a way that life was all focused around those things that we wanted, that we thought we needed, those passions of the flesh, those, those things that we thought would make us happy. But actually, they all just make us sad. We can't look back on those things and think, oh, I'm glad I did that because we actually harmed ourselves. We harmed others. We, we messed up the world a little bit because we are so selfishly motivated. So when Christ comes to save us and forgive our sins and transform our heart to become the people that we're meant to be, verse 22, but now that you've been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness. And so we are becoming holy or, or sanctified. And that's an important concept in Paul's work and this idea of holiness. For Paul, holiness or sanctification includes soteriological status and more importantly, ethical and eschatological perfection. How's about that for some big words? So to be sanctified is about being saved. To be saved is, is that idea that we have partially about, about being free from, from sin and also being saved to go to heaven as such, but more importantly, to be saved inside. You're saved in this life now, and we're part of the God's plan to save the world from sin and brokenness and all of those things. So sanctification includes soteriological status, means we're saved, and more importantly, ethical and eschatological perfection, that we start to make decisions that are good ethically because we have a good heart and we make we have a good character inside us and we're moving towards eschatological perfection how about that for another big word eschat means about the end of time and and the study of the end of times and so in the end we will become the people that we are fully created to be fully reflecting the image of God into each other and into ourselves. And I often say that heaven would be hell if I went there the way I am, because I wouldn't be very loving and kind as I should be in heaven. So if I have reached my eschatological perfection and I'm perfectly loving, then the circumstances of heaven will be perfect because we'll each love each other perfectly in that heavenly state. And so then we continue. And the result is eternal life, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now sometimes when you read that part, we think of the wages of sin is death as kind of this, maybe this guy with a, a big billboard over his uh, sandwich board saying the wages of sin is death, you must repent and turn around. And, and we can just quote verse 23 without the rest of the context that's come before us, but if we do that, we don't take into account what Paul is saying. He's saying that if you've, if you've lived this way, this way of addiction, or you ask a drug addict or an alcoholic or a gambling addict, you've lived this way that, that feeds just your, your, your flesh, you end up messing up your life. You die a little inside every time. The, the consequence, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God, and so now there's this comparison between wages and a gift, because you can't earn this gift of God, is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And this idea of death is, is not just sort of physical death, but it's this idea of the Greek word thanatos, which is um, used here, thanatos, I'm quoting from the Faith Life Study Bible, which is actually a free online study Bible if you want to have a look at it. I'll post a link later. The Greek word used here, thanatos, refers not only to spiritual or physical mortality, but to separation from God. Paul cautions the Roman believers that their obedience to sin separates them from God and ultimately results in death. So the kind of death that we're talking about is a kind of inward spiritual deadness, a loss of life. And when we're talking about eternal life, we're talking about life that God gives us, life in all of its fullness. Uh, this verse in the message uh, work of the Bible, your pension is death. 
you know, if you if you live your life about like that, you're just going to die inside and outside. But on the other hand, if you receive the gift of God, you get real life, eternal life delivered by Jesus, our master. So this idea of being real, of, of having a real life, a life that is full of purpose and, and joy and, and fullness of joy. More frequently uh, in the dictionary of Paul and his letters, they describe the kind of way that Paul speaks about life. This word zoe in Greek is used to mean something other than mere physical existence. So this is something important for us to realize that we're not merely physical beings. We are spiritual beings. We have a, a physical, spiritual existence, a quality of life which comes through faith in and union with Christ. So in Christ, we find the true purpose of life, the true meaning of life, and we're set free to become the people we are meant to be. And Paul combines this with ionios, eternal life, a life which is qualitatively different from life as it is presently known, a life bestowed by God as a part of the age to come. So this eternal life is life that is full in terms of how you live and where you live and, and who you are, your fullness of life, but it is also eternal. It is permanent. It is long lasting. And, and something that we realize, especially when we lose loved ones, is that there's more to life than, than just this moment of being in, in this uh, second of creation. There is more to life because we love so deeply. We have this sense of eternity in us. And so this gift of Jesus links us to the eternity that, that is our potential that links us to the depth of reality that is our potential. Life that is real, as Peterson suggests. Life that is, is, is of a different quality to normal life. We now have a spiritual life. We are born from above and from, and from water and spirit. We, we are, we are multidimensional human beings who are realizing the fullness in which God created us. So as he talks about that, he, he, he then goes back again to what he's been saying about how we are freed from the law and called to live in faith. And so he talks about marriage and he speaks about how a married woman in verse 2 is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is discharged from the law concerning the husband. And, and then he goes on to explain how, how this woman who was married is now set free, is able to marry somebody else without committing adultery because of what's happened in terms of dying and abolition of the law. So when we talk about Christ having died, and that's the big reference from Romans chapter 5 and rising again, then we also understand how, how we are set free from, our, from the old covenant. Where sin increased, sorry, I'm from... Verse 21, so that just as sin exercised dominion in death, so grace might also exercise dominion through justification, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. As we remember how Jesus died and rose again, we are able to remember or to know that we are set free from that old covenant with its bond, bonds and its laws and set free to live in the freedom that Christ has earned for us. And so he goes on, you have died to the law from verse 4 through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. Again, no longer present yourselves, so this is back to chapter 6, no longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. Every part of your being is now meant to be a life-giving instrument to the world. The way that you live at home, the way that you live at work is meant to bring life and peace to other people rather than bring brokenness and harm. And we learn to, to bring peace, to become peacemakers, to become shalom people by taking into ourselves the character of Christ for whom and in whom we have been set free. We're no longer dominated by that sinful nature that, that often seems to make us do terrible things and say terrible things and be terrible people. But we are set free to live under the grace and peace of God. So then Paul goes on, uh, still talking to this um, opponent or this debating partner, 
about the difficulty of receiving the law or dealing with the law. Shall we say then that the law is sin? So what he's saying is that that the law has pointed out to us our sins. And is this therefore a bad thing, this law? No, because if it had not been for the law, we wouldn't know that we are sinning. And so without the law that was written and, and this revelation that came from God through the scriptures, through the laws, people wouldn't have started to realize the character of God and the character of who they were meant to be. And so an interesting law that is an example of how this show, shows up our light is mentioned in verse 8, or in verse 7 and 8. If, if the law had not said, you shall not covet, we wouldn't have realized that covetousness was a sin. Now, this is an interesting thing because people in, in Paul's time, especially, uh, I'm sorry, I'm messing up my slides here. People in Paul's time, especially his uh, Jewish, his, his Roman readers, wouldn't have understood that coveting things was a sin. But in Jewish tradition, covetousness was a sin. And covetousness is named as a sin because it's a sin that goes beyond, in, in the Faith Life Study Bible, again, the only one that goes directly beyond one's actions to the state of one's heart. The point is that one might not regard coveting as transgressing God's law if one were not so informed by the law. So we realize that to covet is actually a sin, and we realize that that sin is something that takes place in our heart that reflects something of the inner nature that overflows into the world outside of us. We also reminded of Jesus teaching, sorry, in Matthew chapter five, you've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. This idea that our inward attitudes produce outward actions and we need to deal with those inward attitudes in order to become the righteous people that we're meant to be. The law helps us to understand more of our human nature, and we can still read through the Old Testament and read through the old laws, and we continue to do so every Sunday as part of our reference for our Sunday preaching because they're so important for understanding our humanity and our human condition. And so as Paul continues, if uh, and and this is a complicated analogy from apart from the law sin lies dead I was once alive apart from the law but then the commandment came sin revived and and then i think maybe this sort of speaks of a kind of rever reverse psychology as soon as we know we shouldn't do something we want to do something i mean i i don't go to the beach for weeks and then they say that i'm not allowed to go to the beach and suddenly i'm really upset because i want to go to the beach so badly maybe that's a lockdown law but the thing is, this this fruit in the garden, it was beautiful fruit in the garden of Genesis. Uh, and uh, Adam and Eve could have eaten anyone, but there was one that that God had said no. And, and, and then this talking snake comes along. And uh, we all have talking snakes in our lives, don't we? They say, uh, you know, sneaky, maybe God's having you on. Maybe you're not supposed to go to the beach because there's something good at the beach. You will not die, says the snake, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. So Adam and Eve have been told not to eat of this fruit, but they start to, 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 to believe that there might be a little conspiracy here. If we ate that fruit, we could be like God. We could be powerful and majestic and, and have everything. And, and we know that the, the idea of that fruit is the idea of the knowledge of good and evil. Um, so, so the woman sees this is good and she, and she eats it and she mistrusts the law that was written down for her. It's almost like the law that said you shouldn't eat from that tree made it even more delicious to eat from that tree. But sin seizes its power in the commandment and it, and it leads to death. But Paul reminds us that Sin works death in us, but even though it's working through something good, that tree was a good thing, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. To realize that these things are breaking us and killing the world. They are things that lead to death, that don't set us free for life. 
and that we should avoid them. We need these laws to, to, to see what's right and wrong and to understand the principles of rightness and wrongness. But when our hearts are transformed by the love of God, we are able to live naturally lives that are that honor God's purposes for us, even, even though we don't fully understand why or how. Or rather than saying we don't fully understand why or how, I should say that we more fully understand why or how because of the new creation that we are now a part of. And so we go on to verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold into slavery under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. And, and this is part of our human nature, isn't it? We so often say such horrible things to people. Uh, we so often do such horrible things. We, we so often have such good intentions on Sunday after church, but by, by the time Monday comes around, everything's out the window. We don't want to be horrible. We don't want to be evil. We don't want to be grumpy. We don't want to be all of those things that, that we end up being. We know in principle how we should be, but the flesh, the, the, the carnal nature takes over and just seems to, to plant that anger or that impatience or, or, or let us say things that are horrible and ugly and, and we catch ourselves in all of these ugly thoughts. And so Paul helps us to understand that, that we don't want to sin, but we do anyways because we're not totally in control of everything. That doesn't mean we can abdicate responsibility. But we are able to see that we're messing up because there is a law. There are principles that are written up for us that we should live by. And so Paul says, it's no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells in us. For I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Uh, this is like the dooby dooby doo verse. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. Now, this is not passing the blame and saying, uh, you know, it's, it's the devil made me do it. It's saying that this sin is very much a part of us, but this sin causes me to, to, to mess up so much. The other thing that comes up in this passage and from verse 14 is this idea of the law being spiritual. And this also reminds us of 2 Timothy 3.16, where we speak about the scripture as Theopneustos, inspired by God. This uh, pneumatikos, spiritual law, reminds us that God's life-giving spirit breathes through these laws if we receive them rightly. But if we receive them as just laws in the flesh, we're just not able to, to deal with them. And so then he goes on speaking about the sin that dwells in us. And i reminded again of the blame game that happened in Genesis chapter 3. The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit from the tree and I ate. And the, and the woman says, the serpent tricked me and I ate. And it's just like us to end up saying that it, the devil made me do it or somebody else should take responsibility for this. And we need to realize that we alone are responsible for our actions. And I like this little Calvin and Hobbes cartoon here. Do you believe in the devil, you know, a supreme evil being dedicated to the temptation, corruption, and destruction of man? And uh, uh, now I'm mixing up the tiger and Calvin and Hobbes. I think he's Hobbes. I'm not sure man needs the help, says Hobbes. And Calvin says you just can't talk to animals about these things. But I think this is a reality. Many people have been asking me, um, is this the devil's work, this COVID-19 thing? Is this, is this God's will? And we know that it is not God's will. And we also know that it's not the devil's work. Um, uh, demons don't live in viruses. Demons don't live in inanimate uh, things. We make this trouble for ourselves by spending so much more on war than we do ever on medicine. So much more on getting rich than we do on ever making sure that there aren't any poor people in the world. So much of the world is messed up by our own desires. It's not the devil made me do it. We can't always give uh, the blame or the credit 
to the devil. The devil's not that powerful. We have to give the credit, unfortunately, to ourselves and take responsibility. Evil lies close at hand, says Paul. And then he goes on to, to, to say that even though I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, I see in my body another war, a war going on between the mind and the body. And, and this is where he gets to this point of just saying, you know, I, I give glory to God, or there's hope in God. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So it is Jesus Christ who will rescue us from our being trapped in addiction to sin and brokenness. Even though we are slaves to the law of God with our mind, in our flesh we are slaves to the law of sin. And that will take us on then at the end of chapter 7 to the beginning of chapter 8 where Paul continues. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. And so this law of the Spirit of life is not just the power of God to help you to overcome sin and addiction and brokenness in your life and set you free, truly free, but also this good news that the law is not the final word. That the law of God is love. Also again from the, I think this is the Faith Life Study Bible. In this chapter, Paul presents God's solution to humanity's enslavement to sin. The Holy Spirit, who empowers believers to overcome the limitations of the flesh and live in righteousness. Only the power of God's indwelling spirit can free the believer from the law of sin and death. So now we've moved all the way from... Chapter 1 to 4, 5, 6, 7, into chapter 8, where we'll start talking about the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer to set us free from the law of sin and death and, and from uh, addiction to the flesh and to give us the Spirit that helps us to become the people that we are meant to be, not in our own power, but in the very power of God, which is the good news of God. And so I hope that this little section has been helpful. A reminder to us of the analogy of, of the wages of sin that lead to death. That, that Not saying that this is the sort of punishment for your being a sinner, but rather the consequence of living like that. The analogy from marriage that speaks about how, how when a husband dies, the, the wife is set free to marry again. A reminder that through Christ's death and resurrection, a death has come to, to the law that, that brought death, and life has come in the Spirit to give us life to bear fruit for God. And then uh, this thing that happens to us when we read the law, and I put the little subtitle, reverse psychology there, that sometimes when you find that something is forbidden, we find that we want to do it more. But also this idea that this law of covetousness helps us to understand that law is helps us to see what's wrong in us that we would never recognize just normally. We need some revelation from God to understand the nature of evil at work in our hearts. And this whole uh, struggle that we have, talking about sin that dwells in us, that, that pushes us and makes us un insecure. But then asking this question at the end of, of chapter 7, who will rescue me from this body of death and this positive thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord, that Jesus will rescue us from this body of death. And now we'll continue in chapter 8 as we talk about the work of the Holy Spirit in setting us free from our addiction and our slavery to sin. So I invite us to pray as we close. Loving God, thank you so much for this message from the book of Romans. A message that was read some 2,000 years ago, in strange places that we could not recognize, but still speaks to our hearts today, as we understand that we are often bonded to sin, addicted to the flesh, and that we need to be set free through the work of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for your inspired scriptures that, that help us to see more of ourselves, our faults and our brokenness, 
and help us to learn to trust in you more and more as a God who set us free from sin, who has loved us unconditionally and is willing to love us out of our brokenness, as a God who sends the Holy Spirit to be a helper poured out in love into our hearts to help us to love as you have loved us. And so, Lord, we know that we'll never get all things right. But in the power of your Holy Spirit, in the presence of your Holy Spirit, we'll be able to live with the right motivation and become more and more the people that you've called and created us to be. Pour your Holy Spirit into our hearts. Set us free to serve you, we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen.